Alice. Hello, Richard. Hello. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for coming. Um, it's an honour. And um, just to uh, sort of clarify the context for us coming together, for anyone watching, uh, you have a new book, Yoga by the Numbers, which you were yes. kind enough to send me and uh, which I've enjoyed reading. And uh, I'd like to use that as a, a springboard for a, a much broader discussion about you know yoga in general, um, and particularly yoga philosophy and how that relates to you know, life in the 21st century, because a lot of these texts don't seem to have been written with that in mind. Yeah, um, but, but before that. before we get on to all of that, um, maybe you could just give us an idea why you wanted to write about numbers in relation to yoga. Uh, well, um, I was associated for many years with Georg Furstein. I don't know if you mm. have ever met him. Yeah, you know? I never met him. No, and um, I, um, I I I have a lot of his books. Um, he he would send me some, or I'd, I'd buy them, or whatever. And one of his books is called Spirituality by the Numbers. He took a different. Uh. It took numbers from different uh, world religions, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, and he, he wrote a book about the numbers and those how they how they worked in those in those particular religions. And I thought, now, oh, what a good idea to do about yoga. So I, I pitched that to, to Shambhal, and, and surprisingly, they, they went for it. So there's the book. Well, there are lots of numbers, obviously, in, yeah. in the realm of yoga philosophy. <laughs> so it's may, maybe not quite as many as in Buddhism, where there's all these lists endlessly. Yeah. And the, compile everything by numbers I, there I, but that surprising I, I number just, i had no idea how many numbers there were i mean I, I just i was just overwhelmed with numbers for for a while until like i got to calm down a little bit <laughs> which were the most obvious ones to you when when you were thinking at the beginning before you dived in deeper um, which numbers are the most recurring the most the most recurring um well three of course mm -hmm. and, and five there's lots, of, there's lots of threes and lots of fives and I, I, the the number I, I liked researching the most was was zero. That was really fun to, to look into zero and, and, and to discover the the origins of the, of the number and argue with my friends whether it's a number or not. Well, I was about to ask you: Is zero a number, <laughs> or is it the absence of which that makes other numbers possible? I thought it was very interesting that the Indians uh, invented zero because they were the ones that weren't weren't, weren't concerned about nothing. In fact, they were looking for nothing in, in, in a certain way, while all the other the earlier cultures were a little bit skittish around zero that they, they didn't really care for nothing that much <laughs> for anyone listening who's, who's not so sure about why indian culture might be a fan of nothing could you unpack that a little bit for us well nothing that's you know that's a nothing it's it's a full nothing it's it's a it's a mm -hmm. pregnant nothing and uh um that, that's you know that's really the the, uh, the goal of, of of a lot of meditation is is to find that 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 potential point where um, uh, you know, uh, the things all come together and then they, they expand out from there. So the emptiness that is everything, in fact. Yes, that's, that's exactly right. And that, I guess, is quite a helpful metaphor for some of the yoga philosophical questions that you were grappling with through the prism of numbers. Um, the fact that you can go in two completely different directions and end up in a similar sort of place, <laughs> emptiness and fullness. Uh, right, right, right. How much are these uh, different systems pointing to the same place, do you think, or, or or are they actually taking people on different journeys? You mean different schools of yoga? Yeah, traditionally speaking. Well, you know, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you. This is uh, this is uh, I'm, I'm talking to the expert. Oh, um, I wouldn't say I'm the expert. I'm, I'm very yes. much the interpreter of the experts. <laughs> well, it's, you know, some of the some of the schools want want to bring you together with the absolute and other, others of you want others of them want to separate you out from from everything it, 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 the classical system is, is is a separative system it wants to withdraw from from any association with nature whereas some of the systems you go into nature to find find the self mm -hmm. That's a really good distinction to, to highlight, I think, if we're thinking about the modern world. I mean, you know, no one's coming to a yoga class, certainly, and probably not going to be interested in a philosophical inquiry that means life in a cave. Um, most people are looking to enrich their existence rather than let go of it. Modern yoga is a whole new world. It, 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 it draws on the tradition, but it's completely something different. And so how do you square that circle? Well... We have to um, we have to acknowledge the tradition. I mean, we, we we're, we're the we're the we're the growing edge of that tradition now. Mm -hmm. We've inherited things that we should be very careful with. 
Um, but I, I, the other, on the other, at the same time, there's there's things that we need to do to to make it to make the, the tradition more relevant to, to our to our situation, to our time and place. It's it's a tricky it's tricky uh, thing to do. I mean, you you don't you don't want to just don't want a rough shot over tradition, but you also want to be able to uh, bring the practice into a, a meaningful relationship with, with the modern world. And I think you, you highlighted quite nicely. Uh, let's see if I can find. Uh, yeah, you wrote uh, yoga is always changing and it's up to us to make sure it always does so for the better. So actually, yeah. you know, baked into tradition is the the constant search for innovation to keep yoga relevant to, to time and place. And, and everybody you know does this without admitting that they're changing things in a traditional context. But obviously today, you know, we can't really get away with that. So, uh, yeah, well, you know, people sometimes think that yoga is, Mon, uh, it's static it, it never mm-hmm. changes and that's that's a mistake i think uh, you know you have to look you, you look you look back into the into the tradition you see it, it's continually changing a lot of course a lot slower than it is now i mean now it's changing overnight and we're in the past it took a few hundred years to make a change but it's still changed and it, it, it and come bring it to this country transplanted into american soil it's it, you gotta you gotta um, do something different with it or else it, it'll, it'll never survive in, in our culture and obviously uh, one of the ways in which that's happened is to highlight you know, embodied practice and um, there's always yeah. been a, a tradition of some form of embodied practice even going back two and a half thousand years even if that practice was to try and you know, <laughs> beat the body into submission and let go of it but uh, these days you know really cultivating an awareness of being embodied is is the first step towards actually seeing beyond what's between the ears that keeps us lost in confusion so that's that's one thing practically speaking but i wonder in you know the the decades that you've been involved with the yoga scene particularly in the united states what you've seen change theoretically or philosophically what what seems to 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 be the you know the cutting edge of that dimension well when i when i started yoga in 1980 i mean there was like maybe two or three yoga schools in the bay area mm. And uh, you know now, of course, it's, there's one on every street corner of a school, and, um, so it's, it's become much more mainstream, as I'm sure you know. And and and, and there's a, there's always a double-edged sword about a, a double uh, double-edged sword about that. You know, it 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 um, it's good that people are getting involved in the practice, but you know, there's a lot of distortion going on as well uh, of, of the tradition. So. Um, 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 I think it's a good thing, actually, that that, that yoga has made it into the mainstream. But we have to be careful to, you know, maintain the idea that it's 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 part of something greater than we are, we, we, and not to abuse it and not to not to not to exploit it for for our own personal gain. And I think there is a concern, you know, to to be careful with that these days. I mean, the the, the term cultural appropriation gets bandied yeah. about a lot and can be in itself, you know, misused, I think, to uh, exactly. you know, all, all, all sorts of nefarious ends. But um, practically speaking, you know, we, we do have to be mindful about this. And, and also, as you, you were saying, you know, acknowledge that there's there's more to yoga than what we might want to do with it. And there's certainly more to yoga yeah. than us. Um, so how, sure. might, how, how, might, how might you define what, what uh, that consists of? in modern language uh, what 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 is this bigger than us that we're talking about well gosh is that is that, is that a question for just uh, a short <laughs> just an easy one you know i thought we thought we'd just start with that you know basics well um you know um modern yoga has really a couple of streams i mean there's an exercise stream mm. where people are not particularly interested in anything more than the physical practice which is perfectly fine I have no problem with that. I make a living off the part of it, partly anyway. <laughs> um, but there are there are people who get into the practice who realize that there's something more going on, and you know the, the, those are the people that uh, want to read books like you know the, the Truth of Yoga and, and books like that. And um, um, oftentimes these these people get into the practice. Uh, after after a life in business or or whatever and they 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 discover that there's more to life than just you know making money and and um and and um it's very interesting to see people who 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 who, um who 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 all of a sudden discover that there's 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 more to their to their practice than just doing a few asanas every day 
Where do you think that comes from? Because it's often not, you know, introduced philosophically for them. It just seems to be an insight that emerges for people. What's what? what, what well, well yoga is transformative. Yoga is transformative. It's very sneaky. Um, you know, you, you start stretching in certain ways, or start breathing in certain ways, and certain things in in your body begin to open up, and you begin to, you know, you you begin to to feel and see things that you've never felt or seen before, and it it, it raises questions about the the world around you, and, and that's when people start to look 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 into yoga more more deeply, more fully. I like that word questions. I think uh, you know there's a, a a lot of concern these days with with answers, and uh, everybody's yeah. got the answer to everything. But um, yoga yeah. seems to be about inquiry, and uh, whether it's approached physically or philosophically, um, asking questions about what we're doing seems to be a good place to start. Um, Absolutely. How, how, how has that been framed to you by teachers you've encountered? You mentioned Georg Feuerstein. Obviously, he was one of the early pioneers of this fusion of scholarship and practice. Yeah. So I, w- I wonder how he talked about this process of you know starting to look deeper. Georg yeah, was a very interesting person. <laughs> you know, I read his book, Holy Madness. He certainly seems to have yeah. been you know, in um, the deep end. <laughs> Georg was a walking encyclopedia. I mean, he he really, you know, if you asked him a question, a simple question about something, or you got, you got a, a 10 minute lecture on the entire range of, of, of knowledge on that subject. Um, but he wasn't much interested in modern yoga at all. I mean, he, he, he was a traditionalist to the core. And he, he, um, he felt that, um, he felt that what 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 we were doing, what the West was doing with yoga, was 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 not uh, was not useful, was not helpful. So he he was always he, he was backward looking in in in, 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 the, in the traditional way. Um, Interesting, and, and he you would, say that. So, sorry, just to interrupt. I, I remember picking up a book. I think it was called. Um... The psychology of yoga, uh, which may have been published just after he died, and uh, that seemed to the, the last chapter. It was called "Towards a Western Yoga," and it seemed to be you know, picking up on Carl Jung's idea that the West should fuse, uh, you know, yoga practice with Christianity and come up with its own system rather than you know mis- mistreating indigenous wisdom from elsewhere. Well, maybe I missed that, but um, as as for the, for the time I knew him, um, I, um, he was very he was very I don't know. Critical is the right word, but he didn't really mm-hmm. care for for modern yoga that much. He didn't like the he didn't like the emphasis on asana and right. the physicality of modern yoga very much. He was more into the philosophical, of course, side and, and the meditation. He was a closet Buddhist, I think, Georg. It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, because if we if we come to the real core of what what yoga is about, I mean, traditionally yoga was a meditation practice. It wasn't about exactly. you know, the only asana was to sit down and get on with it. <laughs> and um, yeah. yeah, in the Buddhist tradition, there's obviously a lot more um, you know, kind of complexity in the articulation of what meditation practice consists of, and yeah, you know, where it's oriented and how that fits together in, into the bigger picture. And you know, in, in mm. the Hindu yoga traditions, not so much said about about meditative practice apart from some of the the wackier visualizations um, or <laughs> Or certainly true just, happy. yeah um or, or in the sort of Patanjali context just sit down shut up and you know <laughs> then, then it'll all happen <laughs> supposedly but there's not much step-by-step guidance so there isn't a lot to work with um so if one does want to start learning to meditate it's often easier to go to the nearest buddhist center and uh, and, and get some <laughs> instruction have you come across people teaching yoga meditation um particularly in California? not much um I've, I've been teaching yoga and pranayama for uh, for 25 years maybe I don't know how long it's been and uh my classes and when I teach those workshops they're they're very small I mean people <laughs> have, have not in the past been interested in doing anything but m- much more than the physical practice mm-hmm. pranayama has been sort of shoved into the background which is of course ironic because as you say that was the that was the um, essential practice for for hundreds of years in in, in, in yoga the yeah, breathing I mean, if, is if, 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 if if you're if, if focusing the mind with sort of the mental discipline, the physical discipline was working right. with the breath, exactly. Right, yeah. right, yeah. So, um, I guess then the question is, uh, you know, how, how to sort of build a bridge between between this uh, sort of practical shift off into a you know more exercise oriented direction, um, and the concern with maintaining a link to tradition, which really can only be done, I suppose, in terms of philosophical orientation. Um, 
because things have changed so much. There isn't really, yeah. you know, anything about what most people do today in a yoga class before the 20th century in an Indian text. Um, some of the postures are older, obviously, but uh, you know, the idea of joining them together and teaching them to busy people from the city to de-stress for a while, that really only started 100 years ago. Um, yeah. So I wonder, well, I wonder what sort of anchors we can we can reach for. Sorry. That's what I was just going to say that we're yoga babies. Um, if you yeah. compare us to 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 to, to people, uh, to practitioners in India, who've been going at it for what twenty five hundred years minimum, um, and we've been going at it. I mean, we can start from eighteen ninety three in Vivekananda, but that really wasn't what we're doing today. I mean, hmm. no, we probably really just go back. To, <laughs> yeah, he was indeed. Uh, you know, maybe we can start with Indra Devi in the night in the late nineteen forties when she came to this country to open a yoga studio in Hollywood. Um, so, you know, we're just, we're lying in our bed, our, in our cribs, I should say, we're wiggling our fingers and that's our, you know, that's our mudras and we're wiggling around in our bodies. That's our asanas and we're going, nah, 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 and that's our, that's our mudras. And, you know, we've, right now we, we, we can't really get a really good sense of what yoga in this country is going to be like, because it's, it's just, this is now starting and it's going to, you know, it's going to take a long, long time for it to get, to really get, get anchored into our society or on our culture, I should say, and make it make have it make it a, a difference with a lot of people. Well, there seems to be a fundamental contradiction between you know the the world of capitalist accumulation and the philosophy of yoga in the form of you know sort of questions about desire. Um, you know, everybody today is all about I want, <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yoga says that's what makes you miserable. So I guess that's that's already an obstacle. But I I wonder if that sort of thing can be reframed to put be put in plain English. It doesn't need to be complexified in the way that Patanjali does saying well therefore you know you can't have any sensory engagement with the world <laughs> so that you don't get attached to things um there are other ways of phrasing the same dilemma but it is still running counter to the you know the, the, the mainstream trend of, of western culture well I, I think the, the thing with Patan the thing sorry the thing with Patanjali is he, he said life is suffering and that's you know that's 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 an overstatement life it is you're right includes, actually yeah I mean people used to say that the, suffering yeah, and 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 the other thing is about Patanjali is he was he was trying to, I mean, really the point of the of the of the classical practice is to avoid future suffering, and um, that that's that that's um, suffering should be accepted and and lived through and and dealt with directly rather than trying to meditate your way out of it. I mean, ultimately, in 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 that classical potentially context, it's uh, prepare yourself to let go of the body, and the sooner the exactly. better, almost, because um, yeah. th th there is nothing but misery, as you say. Uh, yes, and that's, yeah. that's somehow the message that gets associated with the Buddha sometimes—the simplified idea of his noble truths. The first one, life is suffering, but the Buddha never said it quite as starkly as Patanjali. So um, that really yeah. is sort of one extreme of, of yoga tradition. Um, it is a really yeah, stark. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. There are still some things worth having in the Yoga Sutra, um, and uh, I, I wonder if, if if some of them strike you, or whether you are so sort of done with Patanjali that you'd rather throw them away. I think I heard no, you well, once say that you, you you know you would quite gladly give away all your translations and never look at them again. I can't do that. I can't give away something. <laughs> like um, uh, I um, uh, certainly it's an important historical document in in, in the in the development of yoga over, over the centuries mm -hmm. and of course the, the idea of of grounding your practice in in a, in, a, in a behavioral system is is really useful too because it, it it helps you to clear out the underbrush you know don't tell don't 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 lie don't 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 cheat don't steal um you know um and self-study is all is always very important although Swadhyaya in 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 the old text wasn't exactly you know looking at yourself it was looking at yourself through the texts mm, yeah. mold so, yourself I, to, to to the ideal rather than you know try and exactly. inquire into what's going yeah, on it, well that's what ishvara was was a meta yogi and he, you know you mm. were you were trying to be like ishvara you know like and that was your that was your model uh, uh, uh for um behavior static and and unchanging forever um but you know that's that's not going to fly in modern yoga at all no, nobody wants as you were saying earlier nobody's going to want to come to a class and be told that they have to separate themselves from their body to be successful in, in, in yoga and I, yoga modern yoga is a, is, a, is a celebration of the body i think and i, I think that's perfectly per perfectly uh, acceptable is there a limit to that though could it still be well, yogic to course. celebrate the body and just you know be completely attached to the body and you know yeah of course well you know interesting 
the, uh, the 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 root of the word asana is as, you know, and and one of the one of the, one of the definitions of that word is celebrate. So I've always felt I've always felt that yoga is is not just a, a grim, a grim you know a, a grim practice, but it's also a celebration of, of of yourself and your body. That is not something I was aware of. I'm, I'm going I'm getting out my Sanskrit dictionary here because I, I thought they just meant to sit, <laughs> but it means perhaps. to sit. But it, but it, it, it's a very interesting. It's one of the reasons why you, if if you're interested in yoga, it's a good idea to be able to use it in an, an online dictionary mm. to find out about these things because asana based uh, is it, it, it's based in this root that means to sit but it also means to to persist which is a, mm-hmm. a a good piece of advice it also means to to be present and it also mm-hmm. means to celebrate and that so that, yeah i mean i think i think you really highlight there the importance of learning some sanskrit but um, how many people are up for that if they're not so many, not many. coming to pranayama workshops how many are going to go to a sanskrit class sanskrit is is, is a tricky thing um you know it's part of the, it's part of the traditional practice and uh, of course if you want to read the the original text it, it's helpful to know some sanskrit but um Trying to learn Sanskrit, I've been trying to learn Sanskrit for I don't know how many years now, and I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just, it just eludes me. Uh, it's just very difficult for me to, to figure out what, what's going on half the time in in in, in a Sanskrit uh, class. And uh, what would be the benefit, really, then, of learning some Sanskrit, given that it's that challenging, <laughs> apart from well, it being a mental workout? <laughs> that's it. I mean, for me, that's that's part of it. I'm I'm getting older. I'm get, I'm getting older. I, I am older, and. Um, I, I feel like it's a good thing for my brain to 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 to, to do push-ups with Sanskrit, mm-hmm. but it's also a very interesting language. The, the words, as you, I'm sure you know, are like those little Russian dolls where you take them apart. Mm-hmm. There's one after the other, and it just keeps going deeper and deeper. And it, it, it's really, um, it's it's like a little uh, puzzle that you can put together. It, it, it's quite interesting if you get into it a little bit more deeply than than usual. So I think Sanskrit is it's it's tricky, you know. Um, we want to make yoga more relevant to a to a modern audience, but mm-hmm. using Sanskrit is is, is um, you know it it, it it it's hard to know exactly what to do with Sanskrit in a, in in a modern context. Well, as you say, I mean, it's so hard to to master. Like you, I've been chipping away at it for years and <laughs> remain a complete beginner in some ways. But, you know, you get to the level where it's, it's possible to um, at least check on other people's translations um, and to yes. have a sense of how the grammar works and, you know, to be able exactly. to go to electronic versions of text and, you know, see who's done what with it and who's added things in there that aren't actually in the original. So it's helpful from that yeah. point of view. And I think you can get to that level after a year or so of study. Um, but, uh, 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 well in theory um, but at the, at the maybe same two time, years okay let's give it that yeah uh, maybe two lifetimes for me but, uh, yeah. in, in, in some senses though it helps us with this project of trying to to find anchors in in what texts actually do say that we can still hold on to while at the same time being able to be clear what those texts do say instead of trying to make them say what we wish they said and yeah. I think that's often the problem with Patanjali. Um, and it's the problem with many other texts. Um, you and I have talked in the past um, via the Oxford Centre for Hindu Studies about the Bhagavad Gita, which I know you're yeah. not a particular fan of either. Um, although it's got a bit more of a worldly spin, um, it has some other drawbacks. And I remember you were particularly uh, drawing attention to the context on, on a battlefield. And effectively, it's all about action, but it's about action involving, you know, <laughs> The slaughter of most of India's, you know, exactly. uh, warrior caste. Yeah. <laughs> way back way. yeah. Um, are there, Sanskrit, are, Sanskrit texts ahead. are tricky because there's there's two there's two things about them. Um, first of all, as you say, the translations are all over the place, hmm. and that's what that's that's one reason why you want to be able to look into a dictionary and and, and check up on those translations. And also, when we look at a a, a text, we're just looking at it through a, a certain filter. We don't really always understand exactly what was being said or what was meant was what, what was being said at the time it was being said. So there's there's, there's kind of a double bind right there when you're reading a, a text mm-hmm. in translation. No matter how good the translator is, there's always going to be some 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 questionable um, uh, trans, uh, translations. 
We are separated not only, you know, in time um, and space from the authors of those texts, but also, you know, culturally. Um, so we don't exactly. grow up in the West in, you know, with, with this mindset, um, you know, even to take the simplest sort of foundation for yoga philosophy, the idea of life as a cycle of births. Um, that's something that, uh, you know, is, is much more intuitively comprehensible in, in, in an Indian context than it is in a Western one. Um, and, you know, I often suggest if people were to sort of hold up their hands and say if they'd come to class for the first time to avoid being reborn, there probably wouldn't be anybody there. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we have to obviously find our own way of interpreting these these foundational principles. Otherwise, we'd have to let go of the whole thing. Um, and that does seem to come down to this question of suffering. Um, and uh, you know the reason that people want to avoid you know being trapped forever in the cycle of births is is to you know, escape, as you say, future suffering. So the question of how we try to avoid suffering is the the first the first thing. And you've already noted that that might mean lowering the bar a bit instead of eliminating all future suffering by no longer being embodied. We might have to you know tolerate some suffering, but try to reduce it, um, try to alleviate it, try to find ways of dealing with it more skillfully. That could be some ways of of sort of reinterpreting it i wonder yeah. if there are other sort of foundational principles there if you looking as you have done in that book um, yoga by the numbers across you know lots of different texts what other sort of core foundational ideas are still there worth salvaging from the wreckage of, uh, of ancient indian <laughs> texts that don't quite apply to the 21st century well for me um the main thing is that the idea of, of, a, of a single source or for everything that exists, I, I really, um, I, I really feel that 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 I really feel that, you know, I really feel that true, the truth in that, that we're all connected in some way to each other. And it, it, if that was more of a, if that was more widely understood and accepted in, in this culture, we'd be we'd be a lot better off. I think you know you, you when the old texts say when when you look at somebody you see you, you see yourself in that other person, it, 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 you see your essence in the other person. I think that's a really important idea to get across to a, to a modern, uh, you know, uh, a modern uh, yoga practitioner. And that, um, you know, we, we we see ourselves, we see the world in a dualistic way. I'm 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 over here, and you're over there, and mm. there doesn't seem to be much connection between us right now. But if we we think about it, if we if we if we understand that there is that that, that there is a, a common thread running through all of all of life, I think that would be a really helpful thing, um, you know, to to, to um, to to to, um, to understand, and how would you characterize that common thread? Characterize it well. Um, there, there's, um, there's a consciousness is 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 mm. is is is, um, is pervasive in the universe, and consciousness is. We, we are all co co coagulated. Uh, forms of consciousness we, we we all share in that same essential uh, under uh, essential uh, material presence but also psycho uh, 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 psychological presence as well so um i think it's it, it's really it's really very um important to understand that um there's a, there's just there's this really strong connection there's a really subtle connection between us but there but it's it's still there one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. I think Bill Hicks phrased it as in a stand-up <laughs> routine all about, you know, uh, the, the positive uh, potential power of psychedelics. Um, and uh, that's often the way in which people um, these days, and I guess also in your youth, were talking about some of these you know, Eastern philosophies as experiencing through, um, you know, altered states uh, a deeper understanding of, of what's going on you know beyond this limited view of oneself as the center of the universe um, and I was struck by a line towards the, the end of your book where you said uh, in reference to Patanjali's <laughs> lists of powers um, at the start of the fourth chapter of the Yoga Sutra Patanjali gives five different potential sources for powers and one of these is unnamed herbs um, presumably <laughs> some kind of psychoactive substance and you were saying Gil Feuerstein was, was quite down on this idea saying they, they didn't have any place in, in traditional yoga. Absolutely. I wondered if you could elaborate a little bit on that and 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 why he thought that because there are texts that that, that would contradict it. Georg, Georg, well, Georg, I'm, I'm not going to speak for Georg. He was he was a very he was very he was German. I mean, that's mm. that's, that's that says a lot right there. He was he was <laughs> he was very he was very strict, and he was very you know he was he was he 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 lived he lived a yoga life honestly, mm. and, and he he didn't he he felt like 
that, oh, that kind of yeah right and he felt like that kind of that that, that kind of uh, using using drugs was um was illegitimate but it even says so in in, in the text that um that it's it's just it's really not uh, uh, it's not an honest way to get to get to get to get to get into your own in, into your high into your consciousness Although there are some, I think um, the, the Kechari Vidya in the uh, well, it must be about the 14th century, it says you don't get any cities at all unless you take drugs. <laughs> it's, uh -huh. uh, it's, yeah, it, I guess it depends where we look. But um, I suppose I just mentioned that because uh, in some ways, part of this process of, of reframing philosophy is, is, is to make it intuitively graspable. It doesn't have to therefore be associated with the consumption of psychoactive substances. Yeah. Um, but perhaps to speak a language that's less other, that's less Eastern, that's less um, sort of esoteric, um, just talking about the realm of felt experience. That isn't, it isn't something that you have to step into a belief about. It's, it's something that can be directly perceived. And the whole foundation of yoga philosophy seems to be direct perception. Um, the question is, you know, <laughs> where we get some guidance on that, because obviously, yeah. you know, the, the average asana class might accidentally lead to you developing a deeper understanding of the relationship between what goes on in the mind and what's going on in the body and what goes on in the outside world. But um, I wonder if if, 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 uh, if there are ways to, to, to see that understanding a little bit more clearly. I think the first thing to do is stop using the word philosophy. Mm, um, that's a really good point. Because, because Westerners have this, I, I think, Westerners who know about philosophy at all, anyway, have a certain particular view of what philosophy is. And it's dry sort of, and abstract. <laughs> dry and absolutely, yeah. And it doesn't really have anything to do with the body. Yeah. So I think you know, I think uh, if if uh, to make to make to make the Indian uh, teaching more palatable, we have to find a different word for it, and then you know maybe life guidance or something like that. But mm -hmm. um, philosophy, there, we, we, there's a, there's a sort of a switch that just turns off in your head right away when you hear the word philosophy because there's no there, there's no philosophies that I know of in the west and I'm not I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not um criticizing western philosophy there's a lot of interesting um interesting um a lot of connections between western philosophy and, and eastern philosophy but I think um you know um there, there's there's no there's no practice that goes along with most western philosophies it's all in the head and I think um, you know um, uh, we we have to we, we have to um, we have to we have to um, what can I say um, there has to be some kind of connection between the, the, your philosophy and and how you live your life. You, uh, I think um, people don't understand that um, you know they they go to class once a, once a week or twice a week or whatever, and, and they call that doing yoga. Which is a you know a, a mistake. You don't do yoga. You you, you live yoga. You, it's, it's, it's how you live your life, and I, I think that's 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 a really important point to, to make uh, uh, about about yoga. And that is, it's not it's not something that's separate from your life that you just do to, just to, to to lengthen your hamstrings or tighten your buttocks. But it is something that you do to 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 guide yourself through, through your life. It's a really good point, Richard. Thank you. I think on so many levels, first of all, you know, the unpacking of the, the sort of redundancy of the concept of philosophy to most people who are practicing yoga. And secondly, the, the relevance to everyday life. But I think thirdly, and perhaps even most importantly, yeah, it's only very recently in the history of yoga that people have, you know, come up with this concept that yoga is supposed to be the practice and um, all of yeah. these compounds we find in sanskrit so here's another sort of bit of helpful sanskrit <laughs> kind of um, insight um are formed of one word with yoga at the end so you might have hatha yoga physical yoga um, yeah. bhakti yoga yoga through devotional practices but they're the attainment of a state of yoga um, a way of being a way of seeing that is yoga through a particular practice so the practice yeah. that most people are engaged in is asana rather than yoga yoga is potentially the outcome of yeah. uh, a shift in perspective yeah. that might arise yes. through that so perhaps that's one thing also to try and see it could be very easily communicated that you know yoga yoga is a state of being rather than uh, a practice yes that's what i was just thinking it, it, there's a there's it, there's a there's um there's, there, there's a there's a phrase the path of yoga you're on a path of, of, or you're, you're, it's a journey or something like that i think that's a mistake to, a mistaken way to look at, at a practice i mean you are yoga Yoga is um, is is woven into the fabric of the universe, and everybody's practicing. Well, maybe uh, a, a form of yoga, let's say, 
although some people are doing it more effectively than others. But you can't, you can't, you, there's, there's something about, there's something about being alive that, that, that everybody feels in, the, in, in, their, in, their, in, their, in their essence. That there, there's something more to being alive than just, than just you know, the day-to-day -day activities. And everybody feels that, but they go about trying to solve that problem in different ways. Can anything therefore be um, yoga in terms of a, a practice that, that brings about a, 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 an understanding or an intuitive felt sense well, it, of that? If it's done with attention and if it's done with intention and if it's done with the right intention, you know, it, it probably broadens out the, the definition of yoga. I mean, there's there's yoga of anger. You know the story, I can't think of the, uh, the, the, the one where, where he was so angry at Vishnu that he, that he became enlightened because he did the anger so perfectly I, I can't remember the story exactly but um there's a yoga the yoga of anger i mean anything done to it to it to a to a to a um to an extreme that's done with 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 with, with attention and, and 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 um uh intention and attention is, is is a kind of yoga i really like the combination of those two words as well um yeah the, the paying attention to the uh, carrying out of the intention but yeah. then the question is what is the intention what is what, what is the well, yoga intention and what is not yoga in that sense i, I suppose people have different intentions i don't know um i guess the the the, the, the main intention for for yoga has always been to, to, to find out who you are in, in, in your essence um, but the, the, there's also um, in modern yoga, anyway, I think the intention also is, is to is to um, you know help other people out. That's really beautifully put because that's what we don't find in old texts. Um, you listed um, in, in in your book a, a number of ethical principles. In your previous book, Yoga FAQ, there were a few more that you spelled out here. I think you had uh, a list of ten, and most of the ones that you were highlighting that were your favourites from uh, a compilation of 160 or so that you'd made were to do with um, compassion, uh, generosity, uh, qualities of basically kindness in relation to others, and you know those pop up in yoga texts. I mean, the essence of dharma is said to be you know based in 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 that generosity of spirit towards all living beings um but that's a separate thing to the yoga teachings often that's the philosophy of life in the world rather than the yoga texts which are about transcendence of that um so we don't often find those principles none of patanjali's yamas and niyamas is you know, oriented exactly. towards that sort of exactly. loving kindness and yet everybody's fixated on those principles so if actually the the yoga texts themselves don't have those those you know their classical ancient texts don't have those principles highlighted mm -hmm. Should we draw up our own list of ethical qualities? Um, <laughs> how far can we go with this reframing? Um, well, and if we know, did, what would be top? Patanjali's yamas and niyamas are not designed to make you a better citizen. They're, they're designed to get you ready to meditate. Yeah, um, you know that's that's their that's their purpose is to clear out the underbrush so that you don't have any distractions while you're meditating. So I, you know, um, but 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 of course, at the same time, they are they are very. They are very useful. Uh, um, I mean, there's clearly no but, no harm in non-harming, but <laughs> right, exactly, or truthfulness, or you know, yeah. not being greedy, or not being. Uh, I don't know about continence so much, uh, brahmacharya, but um, the other ones seem to appeal. Well, that's the one that everybody immediately reframes. <laughs> so that's the first sign that it's not for us. You know, exactly. it, it, it does mean celibacy. I mean, the commentary says yeah. very clearly restraint of the sexual organ, as you say. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it'd, be, so... it'd be it'd be interesting. It'd be interesting project to uh, to. Uh, um poll people about what they feel is are the, would be the most important yamas and niyamas to 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 be to um to 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 live by it's a really interesting project and perhaps that's something that we could could actually take out of this conversation and and and, and you know find some way of putting into practice i often ask it to to, to you know, trainee yoga teachers when we're discussing ethical principles sort of what 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 isn't on the list and and the list that they right. come up with is usually longer than all of the lists of other principles i've found in texts um, yeah so it's yeah then again that means obviously we're thinking differently about about the essence of yoga and um yeah, inevitably if we're living in the world a philosophy about leaving the world behind is, is 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 not much use to us so we have to have although you were saying that the journey is a little bit misleading because it gives us the idea of a goal intentionality is important and part of that is then to reorient ourselves to think about yoga as um yeah 
a guide as you're saying to life but therefore to relationships and yeah. so to see to see everything in terms of interconnection actually in the mundane world of day-to-day -day interaction <laughs> therefore it does come down to you know being being a nicer person but that has to be cultivated it doesn't just happen by accident yeah. existence is relationship that's 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 what existence is i mean you you, you, you know be, the yogis would go off by themselves and and, and you know the myth would be that we go to a, a cave in the Himalayas or something. Um, I've been in the Himalayas and it's, there's not much to eat up there. I don't know how, how easy it would be to be a, a yogi in a cave in the Himalayas, but um, but you know, um, like Krishnamurti, it's you know, existence is relationship. You have to have, you have to be connected with other people to be alive. Mm -hmm. It's interdependent, isn't it? Really, uh, yeah, it is. There is no way otherwise. And so therefore, if we're, if we're thinking in those terms, I mean, again, it's perhaps <laughs> coming back to Georg, uh, why a lot of people find you know, Buddhist philosophy somehow, you know, there's that word again, but, you know, Buddhist ideas somehow a little bit more intuitively comprehensible because there is this emphasis on compassion and loving kindness and yeah. the, the sort of layman's path being just to be generous, to be of you know, good spirit <laughs> and, and, and perhaps in the next lifetime something else will come, never mind going off and meditating. Um, so, so those ideas about interconnection are much more grounded there because there's nowhere else to go there is no timeless transcendent self standing outside of reality that you can locate yourself in there's just the yeah. you know, complicated soup of interconnected causes and effects go to any used bookstore and look at look at the section on buddhism and it, it, it dwarfs the section on yoga i mean there's, there's there's many more books out there about about buddhism than there's about yoga and yet at the but same I, time you know look at the text like patanji's yoga sutra it's basically you know taking a lot of the ideas that were in the Buddha's discourses uh, exactly. and uh, yeah, repackaging <laughs> them. So, uh, you know, I, went, I wonder if something similar to, to what's happened with, say, mindfulness, which is you know, an attempt to simplify, codify, modernize, secularize ideas from the Buddhist tradition in a sort of easily packaged way, might actually be helpful for the world of modern yoga if, if, if a sort of demystification, sort of de-othering <laughs> kind of process could take place to the point where these things were just yeah, plain simply intuitive uh, more people might start to speak in their classes about them rather than yeah dropping a few roomy quotes and talking about manifesting <laughs> <laughs> whatever it might be um we're we're, uh, we're agents of of the absolute of, of consciousness mm -hmm. and, and consciousness uh, um you know took on the cloaks and, and purposely purposely uh, limited itself in in, in power and in time and space because it's it infinitely curious about itself and it, it does that on purpose to go looking for itself in, in that limited, you know, in that, into that limited universe. And we are agents uh, of that, of that search. And the, the question always is, who am I? And, um, you know, it's not, you know, the I is not, is not the ego. It's, it's the I is, is the essence. And, you know, William Blake said, I, I, I don't see with my eyes. I see through my eyes, which I think is really interesting perspective uh, this it, it's, it's it's the same thing that the yogis talk about this jnana i'm going to pronounce mispronounce this but jnana which is the you know the wisdom in the service of indra it's, i think it's the same the same idea that we are that that it's our job to live life to the fullest so that so that so that um so that the consciousness can eventually find itself very interesting threads there. Um, firstly, the the connection to Blake. Uh, you know, he talks all uh, the, the classic line that uh, Aldous Hux Huxley nabbed for his book about mescaline, <laughs> uh, which borrowed you know, by by uh, Jim Morrison et al. for the naming of the doors, the doors of perception. Um, yeah, yeah. If they're cleansed, you see, you know, as as you really are infinite. Um, and uh, then there's 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 yeah, other connections back to the sort of older philosophy that seemed to be animating a lot of what you were saying there of Kashmir Shaivism. And, yeah, the uh, first time I was in London, I was sitting on these steps, um, just just sitting there. I looked over, there's a plaque, and, and there's a, this was a house, that, that there, there were, the house of William Blake used to live in was, was right in this spot, which I thought was was very cool. But, where um, is that? The, the, I, must, I must go there. It, it's, <laughs> it's over by, it's over by, um, it, it was over by um, Try Yoga, um, uh -huh. somewhere uh on on uh, uh it was over um uh, uh that one that, that that one venue that's gone now that was upstairs i can't think of uh what it was uh, um 
In King, Primrose Hill? Or? In King's Court. Oh, Kingly Court, Soho. Yeah. Kingly, okay. Yeah, Soho, yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah. It's somewhere around in there. I was waiting for Jonathan for, for lunch. Anyway, um, my, my favorite William Blake quote is, you don't, you don't know what's enough until you know what's more than enough. <laughs> that sounds like uh, yeah moderation in all things including moderation turned in, yeah, <laughs> upside down <laughs> yeah so with this Kashmir Shaiva philosophy I noticed sort of creeping into what you were saying there this uh, uh, non-dual tantric worldview um I, I I detected from your book that sort of perhaps the only ancient uh yoga philosophical system that that you still have much time for um, as as a whole, you can still see through that perspective rather than picking it to pieces and taking a few things from it. I, I wonder how you became um, exposed to it in the first place and, and what it is about it. That oh, that's a good question. Um, I can't. I think. I don't I don't really remember. It's been such a long time, but I, I remember picking up the yoga, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Shiva, the Shiva, the Shiva Sutra. Mm. And, and reading that and, and really connecting with that that was a long time ago oh, by the way um i read the ochre robe and ah. uh tantric <laughs> tradition so I, I do know about agananda Bharati. uh Bharati. 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 Bharati yeah. anyway um but I, I i felt all of a sudden that it was that, that there was something that really that really you know spoke to me and i i'm i'm probably misinterpreting it in many ways myself but the idea that 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 the universe is looking for itself it was very appealing to me that the universe is is, is alive is conscious mm -hmm. it's not like uh patanjish prakriti which is uh, insentient it just is like a wind-up toy the, the universe has has uh has 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 intelligence and has creativity and, it, and it's 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 infinitely curious about itself i think i think that's the the, the most important um the most important thing that i can't i can't think of the word the most important thing that you that that you that you should cultivate in yourself is curiosity. Be curious about everything, or be or, 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 or most everything anyway. And um, go ahead. That's, that's another nice word, Richard. Curiosity, because it, it it's uh, it's softer than some of these other. You know, I mean, even the word I used earlier, inquiry. I mean, that's that's you know, it can be quite laser like and sharp and pushing forwards. Whereas curiosity yeah. is an openness. It's an expansiveness. It's yeah. it can be a relaxed project <laughs> rather than a striving one. And uh, it seems that's quite helpful. Yeah, I think being curious is 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 what is what the universe is about itself. Um, that it's 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 it, it it has it has infinite potential, and it, it, it it's it's interested in 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 expressing that infinite infinite potential in in, in, in many different ways. So um, I think that that that's what really appeals to me about Kashmir Shaivism is that it's it that I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna let Chris. Chris, Chris Wallace, take care of that. But, um, <laughs> um, uh, but anyway, I, I really feel like it's it's that it, it puts me into a context that that's alive and it, 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 it's beyond mm -hmm. it, it. It goes beyond my my, my limited self and gives me a gives me a, um, a reason to um, to to engage myself in life because I'm 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 I'm, I'm helping the universe find itself. And yet, at the same time, it's populated by deities, and I wonder how yeah. you square that with uh, some of the uh, the thoughts you were sharing well, you know, about a more rationalist perspective and less time for that sort of thing. I, I don't, I, I don't really know how to put. I don't know what to say about the deities. Uh, I mean, uh, their forces are uh, in the natural forces. I suppose I, I don't know. Uh, I don't really, I don't really have any 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 connection to de to deities. Um, I, I just uh, I, I'm not I'm not I'm not much of a, a worshiper. I don't think the universe needs worship at, at all. I mean, it's not interested in our in, in our in our kowtowing. It's interested in us being fully engaged in, in life. And I, I don't think it really cares if we're praying to it or not. It just is really, isn't it? I mean, it, it yes, it, yeah, it's exactly. The earliest text that talks about yoga, the Kata Upanishad, says all we can say about this, you know, this true self is that it is it exists asti it is <laughs> yeah yeah so maybe that's 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 all we can really aspire to in ourselves the 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 the, the full embodiment of the isness that's what i've been you know the older i've gotten the, the more important that's become in my life when i hit 60 that, that that that's that's when it really started but now that i'm 75 it's really very wow. important to me to to become to become human before i die uh, I mean, uh, it's on my mind a lot right now about 
you know, I'm, I, the, the life expectancy of the average male in this country is about 77 or something like that. So I'm closing in on 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 a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on an age that that that's um, very 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 much you know open to to, to death, and uh, it, it's very important to me that right now, it, it getting more and more, more and more important all the time, to really find out who I am. I, I really don't really I really can't say who that is. <laughs> so um, um, that's that's been the thrust of my of my. Um, my uh, my life, uh, you know, for, for for the last fifteen years, but it's getting more intense as I get older. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I wonder if I might be so bold as to ask you how you feel about the prospect of the end of this life, and uh, and, and how that shapes um, this project. Um, I'm, <laughs> I I I think a lot about it. Um, uh, uh, um, I I don't know exactly what to believe though. Whether whether it's whether it's you know the light turns out you know turn out the light turn out the light um, and then it's over or whether there is something more to it that 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 that, that survives after um, um, do we just sort of um, resolve back into the universal matrix or, or what I, I really don't know but um, I think I'm probably more scared of it than anything else mm -hmm. um, I, I feel a lot of um, I feel a lot of um, trepidation about, I, I think a lot about the day that I die and what that's going to be like, whether I want to die being, a, being awake or whether I want to die in my sleep, which would be, which was more, which is more preferable the way you go out. Um, I, I, this is kind of a weird conversation though, isn't it? Uh, if, if you don't, if you don't mind going there, I think it's fascinating because I think, you know, this um, is, this is what we're not very comfortable with discussing in our culture. And again, in, in India, you know, you can't avoid it. It's it's there in the street. People get burned right in front of you. So yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's not prettified <laughs> and, and and pushed away. And uh, the whole of yoga philosophy, um, you know, if we if we take Patanjali out of this rather sort of na <laughs> nasty sounding ascetic realm of let's leave the world behind, we could see it as preparation for death. We don't need to rush exactly. headlong into death. But um, he says, you know, the, the, the strongest of the five afflictions, the kleshas, um, is this, this fear, this fear of death. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even, even the wise are afflicted by it, he says. So even right. if you've got rid of your ignorance, you still find that one a, a struggle. And there's a good reason for that, too, because you, you really want to hold on to life. And that, that was, that's the problem with Patanjali, or that's a problem for Patanjali. As you said earlier, the, 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 the culmination of that practice is what we would, what we would call death. Yeah. It's because as long as as long as the purusha is connected in any way to prakriti, there's always going to be a, a modicum of, it, of of ignorance. Um, and I, you know, I, that's that's to me to me that's unfortunate. Um, you know, I I I really feel like you you want to you want to live your life to the fullest and 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 hold on to it as much as you can. Um, and, but but it's not just a matter of holding on to it. It's a matter of making something of it. it it's it's just not you know it's just not holding it to tight to tight to yourself, but, but being expansive about it and trying to do something with your life. Um, so I, you know, so um, I'm really, I'm, I'm really sort of, I really don't know what to say about, about death. I, I, I know it's coming and um, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to find myself before, before I die. Don't tell my daughter that I'm, I'm saying this, she'll go crazy. <laughs> I've got a book which I keep meaning to read that was written by a, uh, a Buddhist scholar. Um, Sandy Huntington was his name, uh, C.W. Huntington. Um, and uh, Friend of my wife's. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. She's an old Buddhist person. Okay. And he wrote about his own you know, sort of sudden diagnosis with terminal cancer and uh, how he faced that through the, through the prism of, of, of Buddhist scriptures and uh, yeah. I've been meaning to read it to, to try and, you know, Get me thinking about the reality of you know the, the sharp end of yoga philosophy and uh, and you know how to relate that back to my own life in the first instance, the life of my mother who's you know disabled and struggling these days. Yes. The, the 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 reality of all of our lives that uh, this body can't last forever, despite what some of the Hatha yoga texts say. Um, and in some ways, how to turn that into a manifesto for life, not not for you know life denial. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 an interesting question, and if the, if there is such a thing as reincarnation, I'll be looking forward to coming back. I, I really enjoy being alive. 
it's not that's a really, at all. That's a really nice way of framing it. It's almost turning around the whole philosophy on which you know yoga is founded. Um, yeah. There would be no yoga had there not been the conception of the idea that karma and the cycle of births was the problem, right. and that was the way out of it. Stop, shut it all down. Don't be a person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and to a certain extent, you know, there's some wisdom in the don't be too identified with the idea of me. But um, I think you put your finger on the key to why the tantric philosophy is is, is often much more appealing, um, because that sense of I expands out to fill everything. It, 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 there is no me left. You're just sort of one with all things. Um, exactly. I is the was, universe. Yeah. And that was there in the earlier Upanishads. That's the essence of Atman Brahman. But um, yeah. it's sort of embodied in a much more sort of um, you know, life affirming way through Tantra. But there's a danger, it seems to me, embedded in that. You know, if if I am the universe and the universe is divine in the form of Shiva, um, I am God. And it seems yeah, that you know, there's a, a lot of misbehavior goes on in the world yeah, of Tantra yeah. and yoga, perhaps empowered by that sense of you know, beyond that, all that's when, it's, that's when the ego takes over. And that's you know that that's that, that's that's the problem when 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 you when you get confused with 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 your ego self. Um, that, that, so that's another that's another project that I that I've been working on lately is it's watching my ego. Mm -hmm. I, I, the way I the way I look at it now is it, 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 the ego is a grip on, on my body, and I can I can I can feel that grip. Uh, and I what I've been doing in, in my meditation is trying to find out ways to let go of that grip. And and work 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 with releasing the ego in that way. That's a really powerful um, way of talking about it. I wonder if you could even drop deeper into it and tell us a little bit about <laughs> what that feels like and and you know, how that translates from a meditative practice into life. Uh, what does it you feel? What does that ego grip feel like? It, well, of course. I mean, it. it, it uh, um, I've been practicing yoga for over 40 years now and um i'm, I'm in pretty good con close connection to, to my body and i can feel places that a lot of uh, average people don't don't even, even know they exist and i and i can feel well i can feel this sort of this sort of um uh, in unavoidable uh, maybe unavoidable is not the word uh, you, you, i can't i can't i can't escape from this feeling of tension that i have in my body Mm. and uh, that that's the ego the ego is is um the ego is is self-protective and, and it's the ego is not like a it's not like a wall that you want to that you can try to push against but it's it's alive and it does things it does things to counter any anything that you try to do to overcome the ego mm. so there's a, there's always this constant back and forth between you know between you whoever you are and, and the ego so um I have to, you know, I, I, one of my, one of my, one of my practices, one of my practices is, is to watch myself, watch myself as I express myself through my ego uh, and, and try not to try to express myself in a, in a, in a, in a direct way, not mediated by the ego. Does that make any sense? Makes a lot of sense. Um, a lot of the time, you know, it, it, it is the attempt to, um, control things that uh you know, is is a characteristic in my own experience yeah. of my ego trying to colonize everything particularly in the way that i speak or write um you know if, if i if i find myself writing without um you know, an, an intention to do anything through the writing other than express what's trying to come out um it becomes you know a lot more, <laughs> a lot clearer a lot more easy yeah. to read and you know a lot, a lot more honest rather than I, I... shaped I know something that I've written is good when I when I when I think to myself, did I really write that? That's yeah. when I know it's good. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was gonna say something and I forgot. Yeah. Well, I was struck by this idea, you know, that the ego wants to sort of it's its a shape shifting kind of um, sort of slime that wants to smear itself over things, <laughs> and shut down all of the sensitive you know, filters that can get rid of it. Um, and so therefore, it's, you know, it is basically this colonizing force and it wants to colonize everything. And there's all this talk these days about decolonizing yoga. And obviously there are some you know, grounds for, for that being you know, an important inquiry, but uh, can go way overboard and turn into another tool for <laughs> culture wars to to colonize everything else and i wonder if you know we might be sort of 
most healthily expressed in terms of our own yeah, querying of, of this tendency of that nature to, to colonize what we do. When that's not in the way, then, then there's less, less, <laughs> less sort of harming potential expressed through our self-centeredness. Um, one, one, one of the big, one of the most useful things that I've gotten out of my breathing practice is that it's developing a witness. Mm. And it, it's, it's a, you, I'm, you know, I'm sure you understand it. It's part of yourself that stands away from yourself and watches yourself do what you do and say what you say and think what you think through the day. And that's, that's a really useful, um, it's a useful, um, 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 I can't, I can't think of the word. It's a useful thing to develop, to, to be able to watch yourself constantly throughout the day. I can do that pretty much like I'm doing it right now. And, and um, it, it's, it's, to, to me, it, it's not like, uh, I'm not judging myself. I'm not saying, oh, that stupid thing you just said or, or this and that. It's just knowing what you're doing at, at all times is very, is very useful. One thing that I do is I, is I have a book of coincidences. Hmm. And I, what, what, what I do is I look throughout the day for coincidences. And when, when you do that, you can, you, 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 first of all, you look at, you look at the world around you much more carefully if you're looking for coincidences and, all, and then all this, but it also shows you all the, these, these very odd connections in, 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 in life between disparate things that are just seem to be scattered far, far widely apart. So I have this book it's, it, uh, that I've been keeping for, for the last six years or so. And I'm, it's, oh, yeah. take what you have gathered from coincidence, you know, that line from Paul and Bob Dylan. I don't know that line. Yeah, that's the name of the book. <laughs> I was about to say, are you gonna are you gonna publish this? Because I think no, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. There's no, there's no names in the book. There's only initials, so um, no, no, nobody's gonna be offended by what by 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 these coincidences. But there, but the more you look for coincidences, the more you find. Mm. And um, you know, over the years, I, my coincidence my coincidence index has gone way up. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice phrase. Um... I wonder though if we're talking about books coming back, you know, before before we close to this book, Yoga by the Numbers. If you could yeah. perhaps dis demystify for me what seems to be a, an enormous coincidence, um, you do it quite clearly in in the text. So perhaps I should recommend that people have a look at the book and read for themselves towards the end. But why the yogic fixation on 108? It's it's something I. That's a good question. <laughs> I did a lot of research on that number. Yeah, I noticed. <laughs> And uh, you know, there's 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 no there's no one answer to it. I mean, there's mm -hmm. the, the, there's you know the the idea that it's, it's a multiple of two different numbers, like yeah. nine and twelve, which that you know sort of makes sense. But then again, I mean, why 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 is it a multiple? Why isn't it also an addition? Why isn't it twenty one or something like that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then there's the the whole thing about the 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 diameter of the Earth and the distance between the Earth and the Sun and all that kind of stuff, which is you know interesting, but pretty funky, but <laughs> it's close. Yeah. But I, I, you know, there's, there's no, there's no particular, um, it's, it's, it's one of those numbers like, um, like 84, nobody yeah. really knows what 84 is all about, but there's 84 is all over the place in yoga. Uh, and again, 84. in Buddhism, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's a, a, a 84 classical siddhas and then 84,000 yeah, yeah. ways to get enlightened. It's, yeah, it's um, it, actually 108 is, is part of an, the 18 family. And 18 yes. is, a, is the number that that, that 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 really grounds 108, 18, uh, 18 chapters in the Bhagavad Gita, 18 chapters in, in the Mahabharata, 18 armies in, at war. With, uh, with, at war in the, you know, there's 18s all over the place. Mm -hmm. And why 18 is, 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 is an important number it is also up, up in the air. One plus eight is nine. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> But you know, if you take if you put a zero between one and eight, then you have one hundred and eight, which is, I think, a kind of interesting thing to think about. Well, that brings us back to zero. Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> many mysteries explored in your book, so uh, def yeah. definitely worth dipping into for you know, life is a mystery. Reader. Well, indeed, that's it. Yeah, and uh, and, and it, it, it's a mystery on purpose because it it, it 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 draws us into looking at looking at life more closely to try to solve the mystery beautiful place to end the conversation thank okay. you richard uh, thanks for thank sharing you, all of these thoughts it's been been a real pleasure i really enjoyed speaking with you daniel <laughs>